Hello, everyone. This is the 23rd episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I am joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we start a new interview series with Professor Aldo Mazzucchelli as we discuss the history of Uruguay football from its origins in the late 19th century. Mr. Mazzucchelli is an Uruguayan author and football historian, as well as a university professor at uh, Universidad de la República in Montevideo, and formerly at Brown University in the United States. He is the author of Del Ferrocarril al Tango, El Estilo del Fútbol Uruguayo, 1891-1930. We aim to have a series of interviews with Mr. Aldo Mazzucchelli where we will examine the history of Uruguay football from its origins in the late 19th century, the glory eras of the 1920s and 30s, the 1950 World Cup, the importance of the Copa Libertadores to Uruguayan football, as well as the national team successes in the 2010s. Hello, Aldo. Welcome. Hello, Shem. How are you? And Paul? Very well. Very well. Thank you, Aldo. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you. Aldo, please tell us about yourself and your personal and football journey. I, like many Uruguayans, I'm a football lover. So I, I love the game. And uh, in the 90s, I guess, because of some stories I heard from my older, you know, from older people like my father or and even older all the ones who, who knew firsthand part of the story of Uruguayan football, they would say back then in the, let's say, 70s and 80s, they would say that the history of Uruguayan football has been not very well told or narrated. I understood that we needed to, to re-study that story and kind of narrate it in a different way. Because ever since the 60s, the idea of Garra, Garra Charrua, Garra, you know, I don't know if you know the term, but Garra in Spanish is, is a very well-known term and used even in Spain and many other places to refer to Uruguayan football. It's connected, well, in some best option, let's say, it's connected with uh, the idea of uh, resilient and very, you know, fighty kind of condition, strong, the ability to turn around matches, etc. That that would be like the, the good interpretation that I, I don't think it's the, the one that most people understand, especially in South America. Many people, especially in the 60s on, 70s, 80s, 90s, would connect Uruguayan football and Garra with violence. Okay, so with the idea of just sheer violence in, in, the, in the fields. Hearing these people, I learned that Uruguayan football, by the time it was great in the 20s, 30s, 50s, etc., was nothing like that, but very high quality version of a passing game plus gambetta, you know, and, and skillful players. So by the 90s, as I started, I decided to start studying this and wrote many newspaper or magazine pieces on this idea. And that was in the 90s, my first connection with football that was kind of lateral for me. I mean, it was not my main concern or center like uh, subject, but I learned quite a bit from those first, uh, let's say, research at an initial level. And then I moved to the U.S. and studied there. And then when I was there in the 2000, 2008, 9, I started to delve deeper into the, this story and Especially, this is where my idea came of trying to tell the story of the 20s, especially uh, following the views and comments of foreign specialists, especially French, and Italian, and some Spanish. And that was awesome because I learned that Uruguay was like a, like a lightning appeared in the, in the European scene in 1924 with a football of such a high quality that everyone was mesmerized and surprised about this kind of appearance that wasn't unexpected at the time. And the same I'm saying for Uruguayan football could be said probably for 
Argentinian football because they were a system. So they were like one thing, right? Two different countries that would play to each other continuously during the first period of, let's say, formation of a new style here in the Rio de la Plata area or River Plate area. And by the time the Uruguayan national team made the crossing of the ocean and went to Paris to play on, on the Olympics, that in 1924, that was like a totally unexpected and the River Plate football arrived. And of course, they won the, the Olympics. And this is the source of most of the initial material to comment on the impact and the style of this football when it made its debut at the, at the world level. And then that coincided with that particular Olympics in Paris was a, like a very important moment for world football because of the entry of, first of all, I mean, there were 23 teams competing. So it was a very big tournament and it gathered a lot of interest the newspapers you can you can tell this by reading the the papers in not only french papers but also other european papers and south american papers you see that this was like a very massive event and football was the star of the olympics both things coincided like the arrival of uruguay and this kind of artistic display of a new style and the success of football as a massive kind of sports in Paris, you know, like the capital of modernity, etc. So there were several factors that coincided, uh, let's say, there. So that made for me a very interesting subject to tell a story about that particular moment. And there are a lot of political forces that interact during that particular period because of the internal uh, politics of FIFA, the role of England in particular, and the British, but especially England, and also the other countries that were part of FIFA. There was the after the war, the first war, so there were world politics playing a role there as well. So it was very interesting. So I, I finally, after many years, I took and abandoned you know, the project of writing a, a history book on football, but finally I, I decided to pursue it after, in, in 2018, I, I wrote a script for a mini series of three chapters for television on the origins of your way of football. And then that was like the kickoff for me to writing finally the big book, let's say on, on history of that period. So that's my journey. Can you paint a picture of Uruguay in this late 19th century in sociological terms? main, let's say, headline for that would be to say that Uruguay and the central part of Argentina, uh, what is called the Pampa, you know, and with Buenos Aires, is a, a very rich and fertile area that had like a very turbulent, let's say, political past. But by the 1870s, approximately, the whole area started like a very fast process of modernization and at the same time received like an immense amount of uh, immigration from Europe, especially from Italy and Spain. There were other waves of immigration before from France, especially. And on top of all this, you have a very central position of Great Britain the same as many other places in the world in that period, especially where you had the possibility of investment, commerce, and a connection with the sea. Because as you, you know, Great Britain ruled the seas even into the 20th century. Not only the seas, but also investment and investment banks and capitals would go through London mostly. So the world of money would pass through London and for modernization, you need capitals. And these countries would not have the accumulation of capital required to pursue modernization by themselves. So they depended on foreign capital. And that was mainly uh, British capital, and as well as a little bit of French and a little bit of German capital. Second biggest production here is cattle, especially sheep. I was uh, reviewing that, and I mentioned that in my book, 
that by the 1850s, there were 800,000 sheep in Uruguay. And by about 1880s, there were 17 million sheep in Uruguay. So, and this was uh, something that was promoted by the British. They brought techniques and they uh, started breeding uh, animals, etc. So, the cattle, first it was wool, but then also skins and so leather and meat where it would be like a, an immense source of money for the country. At the same time, railways would be one of the, as in many other places, would be one of the biggest sources of foreign capital, you know, interest for investment, especially British one. In Uruguay, only British. And by 18, the end of the 1860s, the first kilometers of train tracks would be built by the government here, but then almost immediately it passed on to uh, British companies who would get insured 7% of their of, of a capital that was estimated in 5,000 pounds per kilometer, was guaranteed by the government 7% of return to the British companies. So it was a very attractive investing scheme. And at least five, uh, I, I saw at least five uh, British companies would get different parts of the of the country to develop the the train the tra- train tracks and the, and then exploit the the tracks so these were two of the several areas you can mention telegraph first then roads then then gas eventually electric uh, companies etc so m- most of these companies originally were most of them would be British, some U.S. Uh, companies, as, and some German companies, especially with cold industries, so meat plants and etc. So by 1890, or a little bit earlier, maybe, maybe 85, I have the exact year, but it's just an idea, the per capita income in Uruguay would be $217 per year per person, and that was higher than the U.S., so it was a very rich, actually, uh, area in the world. This is important. I think it's known about Argentina, but it's like, a, it's like a system. So both countries would enjoy this kind of wealth, let's say, and along with that came a widespread educational system that in part was, was British, but not, this is not a main, uh, mainly a British thing, but it was uh, the effort of some positivistic, etc., like governments in both countries that created like a public school system, especially primary school, up to 12 years. Then by the end of 19th century, you would have, of course, university and secondary education. And analphabetism would be like um, less than 50% by the end of, of the 19th century. And very quickly, you would have almost universal literacy in the population. So those were the conditions you had a lot of immigration because there was a lot of jobs and workforce was needed. And that gave opportunity for several political reforms in widening the democratic situation of politics by the end of 19th century and beginning of the 20th, especially in Uruguay. So it was a a very, I would say like very nice (laughs) In, some, in historical sense, conditions for the development of a, let's say, democratic football. That is, I think, one of the key issues with uh, this area and football. Because, in particular, football played a role in democratization of the society. So it was like a conduit for uh, connecting classes and gathering people, you know, like educating outside the schools people in some discipline, etc. So, and that the government, in particularly in Uruguay, the government understood that quite early at the beginning of 20th century and applied used football, like openly to educate, let's say, in some way, uh, the general population. In terms of size, Montevideo would be like 500,000 people, and then it grew up to a million during this period that we are reviewing. So it was about a million people. So you have a very mixed up population from mostly Mediterranean, like Italian, Spanish, and Criollos or 
people born here in, in, in the country, first, second, third, fourth generation immigrants, because the, the country is quite new in, in sociological terms. By the beginning of 19th century, you had a very, very few people living here because this was the very last area in the colonial Spanish empire in Latin America that was in South America that was, it was never interesting for a colonial regime because there were no gold, no silver, no mining here. And cattle was growing like free for 400 years, more or less. It was only important in geopolitical terms because it's the, the mouth, let's say, of the river is an entry to the heart of South America. So this is why the British in particular were always, ever since the beginning of the, or the end of the 18th century, would be interested in playing a role here and having, you know, like some stronghold in River Plate. Actually, there were a couple of intents of controlling militarily or by the military and by the Marine, in particular, this area that failed. But this was the only, I would say, geopolitical importance until the time this became interesting in terms of trade and etc. Yeah, thank you, Aldo. That's a very good, very interesting background to it. And can you describe then the, the origins of football at the end of the late 19th century in Uruguay and especially the influence of the British? Sure. Yeah, well, the origin of football here is the same as the origin of football in, in the continent, in Europe and many other places. It was the British in general, in Uruguay, particularly English, mostly English people, who, who started playing it within the community, the, the British community. In 1861, there's the, the first British club founded here that they say is the oldest in South America, possibly is, because 1861 is quite early. And that club is, is called the Montevideo Cricket Club. And so the British society, let's say Montevideo, would gather there. And then in 74, I think, yeah, 74, there was a rival club, also British, formed that is called the Montevideo Rowing Club. So the names tell you about the sports. They would favor cricket and, and rowing. And they would start playing football among them, between them. And uh, the first match between them, I think, is 8-1. Before that, you, you would have some games played ever since 78 between the Argentine, British community and the Montevideo British community. So the cricket playing against, or the, the, the cricket and rowing playing against some counterpart in Argentina. But this was, I checked the papers, etc. This was a, an all Englishman game. So there were no Criollos playing there. Maybe at some point in, I saw in 89, so you have a 10 year period. It's very clear, 81 to 91 where you only have cricket and rowing playing matches maybe two, three times a year. So it was like a party, you know, with uh, all the families going there and the whole day, you know, sharing, like having some food, etc. And doing other things, playing music, etc. And then football was part of, of the gathering. The big moment, let's say, would be the, the football match. And by the end of this period, in 89, I checked a very, actually, one newspaper that is called the Montevideo Times, that was published in English in Montevideo, would publish like a chronicle. And actually, this is the first time I saw that one newspaper would publish two competing chronicles of the same match at, in the same edition, so in the same page, actually, with two different people writing each of them. And so it, that was very interesting, actually. And there I saw maybe one player that was not British, but probably he was the husband of somebody you know so it was inside the community that the thing was played and so this is the situation up to 1891 there were a couple of schools when i say schools i say probably primary and second so on and high school as well who were founded in uruguay and played a role so the first one is the english high school that was founded in 1874 by a guy called Henry Castle Eyre, who was born in Somerset in, in 52. 
so was he was uh, English, and um, he would favor the the introduction of football as part of the curriculum, like in public schools in Great Britain or in England. And then in '85, you have the English school founded by another guy, Thomas Ash, Thomas J. Ash, and they as well would play football. And in this second one, it was particularly important because there was a guy uh, named William Leslie Poole, and he is considered the father you know, of, of football in Uruguay. So you asked about particularly what particular persons, you know, like play the role. So he's the first one I should mention. William Leslie Poole was apparently was a good player, but he was very enthusiastic and had this kind of missionary, you know, like kind of uh, attitude about football. So he fought the, the rules of the game by according to, uh, in the form they had back then. They were, as you know, not the same as would be later. And he had several kids like playing and one of them that was actually born in Montevideo to a, an English mother and um, I think a German father or an Alsatian father from France, the Henry Candid Lichtenberger. This is the creator of the first club in Uruguay. So he was a pupil of William Lipool and he created what was called Football Association, not very original. That was the name of the first club dedicated or devoted exclusively to football. Uh, and they, they founded that on June 1st, 1891. So you have the 10 years, 81 to 91, and in 91 you have this uh, first. They would play and lose to, to the cricket every time. And originally, Lichtenberger had the idea of only people born in Uruguay would be able to play in Albion because this football association would change its name very soon to Albion Football Club. And they probably got tired of losing every match. So at the end of a short period, they changed the rule and allowed British or English men or Scottish, whatever, to play. And by that moment, that is like 92, probably, they were like the first decent football team and they got, apart from the cricket and the rowing, they got another rival very soon. And this is the Central Uruguay Railway Cricket Club, who was created by the engineers and directors of, the, of one of the train companies the, in September 91, uh, so a few months after the Albion. And they wouldn't play football for the first year. But finally, in, in May of 92, you have the first uh, match between Albion and Kirk. And mostly Albion dominated th that decade, let's say. And um, cricket would win any match they would play. I, I think they never lost a match. And they finally got tired of winning and retired and never played again by 1895 or six or something. And then that was like the signal that the other people was getting into the game in different ways. So first you have Criollos, like people born in Uruguay, maybe first generation still from German, from, from German people, from British, British people, from French, etc and some from all families in the country who would start playing like recreationally in area of Montevideo at the very south tip of the city that was not city yet there, a place that is called Punta Carretas. Now it's a posh neighborhood, but back then it was like a countryside and they would use that area to create a few pitches and they would play there. So they would play all mixed. And this is interesting actually because these formal, you know, like English teams would go there to practice and they would allow other people to enter and play, etc. So it was more open, I would say, seen already. And uh, there you have the first Uruguayan, like mixing up and, you know, with the other guys and play. And actually, I should mention here one anecdote. No, it's a historical fact, actually quite important, but 
So by 1924, when Uruguay won in Paris, that was the first time that local newspapers realized that there was a history to tell about football. So that football had a history, actually. So they started interviewing people who would be witnesses or part of that original scene. They were, of course, alive. They were 50, 40 years old. So two of them, separately in different interviews, mentioned that a couple of guys... Uh, one of them is called Jose Baggi Ordóñez, and he is the most important politician in Uruguay in the probably in the 20th century. And he was the head of the reforms, the democratic reforms, and that actually changed the country forever in the first two decades or three decades of the 20th century. Well, this guy, Baggi Ordóñez, was a very early aficionado. You know, so he would go to Punta Carretas and, and follow Albion <laughs> and see all these matches, etc. So it's very, it was very interesting for me. Actually, I, this play an important role in my book because uh, this is uh, some hint uh, that this guy, along with a couple more who were also politicians important in the first decades of the 20th century, would realize very early the potential of football. And uh, so they were not inches, not fans, of this particular team or that, but they liked the scene and, and understood what this could be. So we have this scene in Punta Carretas, and then this is the time when in different neighborhoods in Montevideo, particular three or four neighborhoods, people from middle high class who would have education, etc. some of them university and some of them technical education that was already in place, back then would start creating small clubs with zero infrastructure. So they would gather in a bar or in the house of one of them and say, okay, now we are called this and that, and we have this shirt and we are going to play. And this was kind of very fast. So you can start seeing this in 1898, 1897, 98. There were actually two teams that, you can notice back then those years, one of them was created by a guy who would, he was the son of a British family who would go to study to England and then he came back and created one team. And then you have the German community who created another one. So you have four, actually, the Kirk, uh, Albion, and these, other, these two other ones. And all the little teams in neighborhoods made, created by the Uruguayans. At some point in 1900, these four elite, let's say, teams would create the Uruguayan Association in March 1900. Everything was conducted in English. The proceedings were in English. The name is in English, etc. So, and this was the origin of the Uruguayan Football League. So the first league was played by these four teams in 1900. No criollos still except for a few players, maybe one or two, who would play in Kirk in particular, and maybe in Albion as well. So from these many, or maybe a few, let's say dozen or ten or dozen small teams created by Criollos, you have one important one because it was sponsored by the public university, Universidad de la República, where I teach now. So... This team, this is maybe a kind of a different note, but I have to mention this, that positivism and social Darwinism were like philosophical important currents. And they shaped the elite of the country from the 1870s on. Kind of the same happened in Argentina and many other places. It was a worldwide phenomenon. So local high schools and universities would include sports as the idea of shaping the character, etc., following the, the British, actually, original idea. There were different tendencies here in the world. The Germans had one, the British had another, etc., different uh, nuances. But the general idea of we have to include physical education in the curriculum was there. So these guys from high school, because high school would depend directly from the university back then uh, in 1899, they, with the aid and sponsored by the head of the university, the rector, as we call, like the president, let's say, of the university and other professors, would help these guys to organize 
And they created the first Criollo team that is called Club Nacional de Football. So National Club of Football. This is Nacional, the team that is well known even here where, from where Luis Suarez came from instance. And they won the Intercontinental Cup three times. So it's a big, a big team. One of the big two in Uruguay. Yeah, as well as Peñarol, that is the continuation of the Kirk. So these two powerhouses, let's say, were in place by 1899. At the same time, even a little earlier than, because Nacional was founded on May 14th, 1899. And uh, they played their first game like in a month, more or less, in June 99. And we can go on about this later, but the, that very first match that Nacional played had like 3,500 people in the, by the field and discourse from the rector of the university, etc. So it was obviously like a political move, let's say. So the idea would be like emulate the British and say, okay, we, the Criollos, can also play and can play well, etc. So the league would not allow them to enter. <laughs> and Nacional started to absorb, let's say, many of the best players of all these little teams that would exist independently in different uh, barrios, in different neighborhoods. So they became quite fast, like a decent team. And uh, they would be able to play already in 1900 at entry level, I would say, in, at the level of the league, but not yet being able to win to Kirk, but, you know, like losing for one or two. And actually, one of the very first games that were played in 1900 in July was between Kirk and Nacional. So that was the first derby, <laughs> say that the first instance of what would become like an important derby very fast in two years. And I can tell the story why this happened. But Basically, these were the, the very, you know, the, or, the origins of the game. And by 1900, you more or less have all the pieces in place. You have a couple of other teams that were important, actually, Criollos. One is called Montevideo Wanderers. It still exists, and it's a very yeah. nice team, white and black shirt. And you have another team that is very important, doesn't exist anymore. Now there is a team with that name. There, there are two, actually teams with that name, but this was the very original one that is called River Plate Football Club. They were created in 1898, no, 99, sorry, um, by the very beginning of maybe March, April of 99. I found like some newspaper stories about them playing in Punta Carretas, some games. And what this team had of, of different from other ones is that at least half of them were workers, like working people. They would be like newspaper kids, sellers. Some of them would work at the harbor because Montevideo has always had like a big or important relevant uh, harbor for the area who would compete with Buenos Aires. And probably that's the reason why there's two countries originally and not one. And the goods that would come to the harbor would come in sometimes in boxes with the letter River Plate because that was the way, I don't know why, it's because it's a, clearly a deformation, right? But the British would call River Plate the area instead of, because the, the Spanish name is Silver River, right? Rio de la Plata, right? So it's not a translation, it's a different thing, but they would say that. So these kids would read that and they would use the name for their team. This proletary, let's say, original team. Nobody would allow them to play anywhere. They would play with other amateur teams. And... Um, so this is the origin of this name. Then in Buenos Aires, there was a team founded later in 1902, I think, or 01. That is the, the very well-known River Plate, uh, Club Atletico River, River Plate. And then this team, we would speak about them when it's time because it was important in the democratization of football, but they disappeared by 1920, more or less, to never appear again. So in 1932, there's a, a third River Plate, Club Atlético River Plate, that still exists and is playing there in my TV. That was founded like as a um, homage to the earlier River Plate, but it's a different thing. They have the same shirt, red and white, but it, it's a newer version. So Wonders River Plate, Albion, Nacional, uh, Kirk, 
there you have like the, the original pool from where you would get all the rest. And that was in place by 1900, even though they, Nacional and, and River Plate would not be part of the league. They, Nacional entered the next year. In, in 1901, they were accepted because they were already receiving invitations to play in Buenos Aires and they would be traveling to Buenos Aires to play. So in the league, basically, and they were, they were connected people from Criollo Society in Uruguay. So they would finally be accepted. And in 1901, you already have like a five team league or maybe six because Wonders entered as well in a couple of, you know, not in one, but then a couple of years later, you see the league growing, you know, like every year, one team more, two teams more. So that is in very blunt, I would say in simple terms, how these different currents would connect to each other by the beginning of the 20th century. Many English teams toured South America in these uh, first decades of the 20th century. How did their participation in these friendly matches expand the game in Uruguay? In 1904, we had the first touring British club that was Southampton. They arrived in 1904 to play a series of exhibition matches. There was money involved, of course, and this is important because so people would pay to watch them and uh, they would play against some sort of national like uh, combined you know like team they would tour the rio de la plata so they would go to buenos aires and montevideo sometimes other cities rosario as well that is a big footballing city from that period as well for the same reasons because you have a train company british train company in uh, railway company in rosario from where Messi comes and many others, because it's a famous footballing city, let's say. So Southampton was the first. Some local or foreign entrepreneurs would bring, so agents would bring the teams and arrange a few matches and make some money and go away. Actually, I found a very interesting comment in the Diario del Plata, in the paper in 1914, that already makes a sort of, small history of all these visits and a sort of a balance as well that to me is very interesting because the guy who writes this is able to synthesize what these visits would leave as teachings when after they came and by 1914 there was already a discussion about money and about why these teams can come and play to the, with this team or that, and why this field is used and not that field. Because So there were money and there, there was a discussion. And this discussion evolved as well, like more amateur British culture, culture clubs in the area who would be the hosts normally of these English teams or British, because there were some South African teams as well coming. And uh, the other teams that would want to be part of it, but they were not allowed to be part. And at the same time, there was the problem of amateur culture who would consider that these English teams should come and not charge anything because it's the amateur culture, right? So why would you charge money? It's understandable that you need some money for the tickets and for eating, but why would you make money out of it? So this is one of the seeds of the discussion between the amateur culture and the professional culture that was already I wouldn't say in full steam, but by the beginning of the second decade, it was already an issue of discussion. So I wrote here, I'm, I have Southampton, Nottingham Forest, South Africa, this is the South Africans, Everton, Tottenham, and Swindon Town. These teams at least would tour the River Plate uh, before 1914. Some of them maybe more than once. These were the teams that traveled. And apparently for footballing and also for economic reasons, financial reasons, it was a good idea for these British teams to do the long trip, the long journey and go to Brazil, maybe some of them, but mainly to the River Plate that was the, the big scene, you know, to play in South America. I, I have no notice of them traveling other parts of South America because football was still not as developed in other areas. I doubt about Brazil, maybe they, by the end of the period, they would already be able to play in Rio or Sao Paulo. 
Well, Brazil's very first national team match is actually against Exeter uh, in the English team in 1914. So exactly. yeah. I guess, yeah, yeah, they had a late start compared to Argentina and yeah. Uruguay, but eventually, yeah, mm-hmm. I guess yeah, by that I, decade, it would catch up. Yeah, I, I don't want to enter into this, but I think Brazil developed their clubs in the same way. Uh, the, the, some British clubs, etc., in Rio, mostly, then Sao Paulo. They, immediately, you have like a sort of, of um, rivalry between Sao Paulo and Rio. But one of the differences, I think, is the political culture in Brazil has always been quite different from River Plate because it was a Portuguese area, not Spanish, and also it was an empire, you know, like uh, the Portuguese uh, king would travel to Brazil at the beginning of the 19th century and establish the, the court in Brazil. So you have an, an imperial, a full-fledged, let's say, imperial culture in Brazil uh, that created like a strong elite, highly cultured, very connected with Europe, etc. in Rio. But then at the same time, a kind of a stronger division between the power and the people, you know, in, in Brazil for that lasted quite a bit. And probably because there was no money here, it was not that important. So we never had like a, this kind of strong elite and that probably played the role in the form of democratic institutions and the sociology you know of the countries in the area so yes these were the teams and actually one important point that we can advance maybe we can go deeper later but it's um it's the idea that you have professional british teams including scottish and british players coming and playing here by 1904 on and, and later. And this has something to do with the style of football that people here were able to learn by watching. Actually, that newspaper article that I mentioned mentions or goes over different aspects of the game that people here were able to learn. And actually, the first and more, most important one was the passing game. This is what they say, actually, in the, in the paper. So the passing game is not, at least in this area, I, I don't think this idea that is quite popular among some historians, that it was like one British guy, who, a Scottish guy, sorry, who, who told everyone how to develop the passing game. That's, that's fans, it's impossible. First of all, because there were like hundreds and hundreds of football players that would be playing in three different cities amongst each other for 10 years before 1904. And uh, actually all that period is clearly dominated by more archaic, let's say English style, more akin to rugby or American football, you know, like this kind of one line advancing always forward, passing would be considered something that a a real man (laughs) would, would not practice very much because the idea was to actually hit the other, the other guy and impose your stronger uh, physical condition. Long passes were described all the time. So hoofing, you know, like an, a long pass from the back to a very strong, normally a center forward who would fight against all the other guys. And then maybe you get the second ball. So it was all this, you know what I mean? So this kind of original rugby-like People running forward, you know, and kick and, and rush. Yeah, and hitting whatever is ahead of them. And I think the same happened in Scotland much earlier. There is smaller guys realized that if they pass the ball, they had like a, some advantage, right? So they would avoid this physical style of play. And uh, this is exactly what happened here, and it's very well documented by first-hand witness uh, players who would write later the history of this original uh, period. And they would say, well, yeah, the Criollos would learn very fast that if they pass the ball, and if, especially if they can make short dribbling, that is not the original dribbling, that was like a, you know, like a long run with changes in direction, that is the same you see now in rugby, or that was the original dribbling, idea of dribbling, but here, the gambeta, as we call it, 
Gambetta is, is a Spanish word that comes from an Italian word. That is, gamba means leg in Italian. So gambetta is like a little leg or something like that. And it, it's a very old term from 16th century. It's connected with dancing. So uh, gambetear here would be, especially from a country of Italian immigrants, would be understood immediately by the people. Was this leg game, you know, or of small rushes and changes of, of leg, etc., that was developed here by the Criollos, particularly from 1900 on, on, from 1899 on. And it appeared, especially in Montevideo and Rosario, because in Buenos Aires you had a stronger uh, English culture, a bigger one. And even though Alexander Watson Hutton who is the father of Argentine football, he was a Scot, actually. And it's maybe more logical that the passing game, and I would venture to say that this is true, that the passing game was developed first by the Argentines in the area than by the other cities because of the influence of Watson Hutton and some other Scots and the alumni, that is, the most important team in Argentina until 1910. As so important that practically they won every single league, not all of them, but most of them. Leagues, matches, etc. So they were like the Brown brothers would dominate the football in Buenos Aires for all this period. And they were all British and they would probably develop the passing game, not to a refined, you know, like say, but they had some, some ideas about it. And from 1904 on, actually the impact of Southampton when they arrived was exactly this, the passing game. Uh, there's chronicles saying, we saw these guys, they were huge at the harbor when they arrived. They would look like elder, older than us, etc. And we say, oh, these guys, I mean, they, are, they look like old ladies. We are going to beat them. And so they entered the field and they formed there to start the match. And this Uruguayan witness who watched that first match against uh, the Uruguayan team say, well, we practically were never able to get the ball. They would not run. They would just pass the ball, pass the ball, pass the ball, and we wouldn't be able to get it. So Southampton at the very first match in Rio del Plata in Montevideo was passing game was the central feature already. And it was the very thing that made the most impact on the Uruguayans back then. This, I think, is proof, or at least strongly suggests, that the passing game was not developed uh, very well, at least until 1904 here, right? So you have the drip, the gambeta, and some criollos already trying to avoid the physical um, game of bigger Anglo-Saxon guys, but that was it more or less until 1904 on. And then from 1904 to 1910, approximately, you have a very fast learning process. And by 1910, you have in the matches between Argentina and Uruguay and teams, you have already a, the Rio de la Plata school already in place. In 1912, in particular, is the year that most people would, would mention as the year where Uruguay and Argentina already were playing high quality football, including passing game and gambeta and some tactical intelligence already original from the area or at least developed here. Of course, nothing is totally original in the sense that other places would develop the same skills, but they developed in parallel, I would say, not because it was, there was a direct influence. Actually, I heard some Scottish historians who would mention that Scotland developed the gambeta, whatever the name you use, as well very early on in the, eight, in the 1880s. And I have no doubt about it because I don't know about that. So it's possible that the same process happened. But what strikes me is that when I started noticing about the Scottish football, gambeta would not play any role. I remember at a match in, in 54 between Uruguay and Scotland in the Switzerland World Cup. 
it was terrible. I think Uruguay won eight zero or some or seven zero or something yeah. like that. Seven, yeah. And I watched the full match because it's filmed and you can watch it. There's no trace of any individual, let's say, skills in that Scottish team. That's probably because of some decadence or I don't know what's the historical reason. But if that style was part of the original Scottish football, which I have no, I cannot, you know, have opinions about it, but it eventually disappeared. I don't know why. So that's an interesting uh, thing. Apparently, there's no doubt that Scottish were the first one playing the passing game. And at the same time, I tend to think, and I would discuss this and have arguments and can show newspaper articles and pieces of history that prove that the passing game was brought here mostly by the traveling uh, professional teams. That, that's um, very interesting, although that's covered a lot of um, ground as well in terms of the, the culture and the, the tactics. But just to touch on the, the Uruguayan League, um, after that started, how did that become established and what was its reception by the, the population in the, in the early years? How did that expand? Well, yeah, there's a couple of things there. You can start by the, by the fields uh, because that was again, linked with business. It was the tramway companies that mostly created the success of the league, apart from the football teams, of course, and apart from the rivalry between Nacional and Peñarol or Nacional and Cook. Why? Well, the tramway companies, there were several ones in Montevideo and the city was already extended. So there were an objective need of new lines, you know, and new tramway lines. Actually, they were um, horse-powered until 1907. That's the first electric uh, tramways here. So these horse tramways would start buying some land in the outskirts of the, of the center, not, not in downtown, but around downtown. Let's say five, mi- five kilometers, 10 kilometers, no, yeah, five, more, more like five, a radius of five kilometers around downtown. And they would offer this, they would create a football pitch, offer it to some team or teams, and people would have to go there. So they would pay for the tramway uh, ticket. And that was a big business for the tramway companies, I guess, because they repeated this scheme like many times, and they created different venues for football. The very first one was the Albion, one in a, a, a neighborhood called Prado in Montevideo. This is a beautiful neighborhood and they created this first football field there and that was in 1898. Yes, 1898. And then you have another company in a different line, so going northeast of the city who uh, created like a Parque Central that is now the National Stadium. And is where the first World Cup would start being played as the the first uh, venue. And that was originally from a German team that had an arrangement with the company for some months. And Nacional immediately started using it. And uh, then it was national home for ever since 1900. And then eventually national bought the, the field and built a first stadium, then a second. One of them burned down because of a big fire in 23 and it was rebuilt, etc. So it's a long story. But the, these and other fields like the Wanderers field were all part of the same scheme. These tramway companies would create as well uh, what we call balnearios. It's like this idea in the in the French, you know, Atlantic coast of places where people would go to take uh, sea baths in in the summer, etc. So they created hotels in the shore of Rio de la Plata, and they would transfer the people there back and forth. So they created the same scheme for the beach, let's say, culture. And actually, many teams would never own their own fields, but they had them leased or whatever from a different owner. So it was a joint venture, I would say. This is the origins of the football pitches where the league would start being played in 1900 by four teams. 
Then you had the enter of Nacional in the first in the second year, so 1901. And uh, in 1901, you have two derbies played, both, I think, won by the Kurk. But Chronicles would go like, oh, no, but Nacional was very resistant and very strong, blah, blah. So they were already trying to raise themselves to that level. And then in 1902, there is this phenomenon of three brothers called Cespedes is the last name. Two of them were the very first gambeteadores and great players, you know, both playing as forwards, who would be like um, the very first, one of the very first expression along with another guy called Mikel Erena, who would play in Wanderers, and a guy who called Juan Pena, who was playing in, in Kurk were the very first ones who developed Gambetta to a, some interesting level. And actually, my idea that Gambetta was more like a Montevideo thing is that when Nacional went to play in Buenos Aires, before even entering the league in 1900, the, the Cespedes brothers would be like a, the highlight of the venue because of their ability with the ball. That was not very common in Argentina still. So this is very little history, but some, some details, you know. So in 1902, these Cespedes guys who would play in different little teams in Prado would have passed to Nacional. And they, along with other guys who also came from different teams, made of Nacional like a very strong team. And Nacional won the league that second year, but especially won the derby against Peñarol at Peñarol home in, I'm going to explain what Peñarol is because it's a very strange name. But so this created like the origin of this rivalry between the team, the two teams. And obviously there were some sociological reasons. Both of them were competing under the umbrella of modernization of the country. So both of them would want to play the metaphor of the new, you know, and the advanced, etc. At the same time, there was this nationalistic factor playing on favor of Nacional because it was the Uruguayan team against the foreigners to some extent, even though by that time in Kurk there were already several uh, Criollos, uh, Uruguayan players. And uh, okay, so this is the two factors that I mentioned, the, the rivalry between the two teams and the business linked with the tramway companies that created some of course, this was accompanied by marketing, right? So the, the tramway companies would publish the matches and they were, they were like a party when they would play, etc. So you have crowds, decent crowds of a few thousands, even maybe sometimes 10,000 people going to, to watch the league, the more important leagues, most important league matches by 1901, 2, 3, 1901, 2, 3. So you already, uh, because there were no stands, in most fields you would only have like a talud, like a, um, a knoll, I don't know how to call it, like around the, the pitch, you can accommodate much more people, right? Because there were no stands. So these numbers, these figures come more or less from the tramway companies, had a way to know it because they were selling the tickets. And uh, sorry, the tramway tickets. There were no paying for the matches back then. But already by after 1905 and 1910, in that five-year period, I guess, some matches started to take money to charge a fee for, to the public, becoming professional, even though not openly, but it was, uh, the professionalism was starting already. By the, by the second decade of the 20th century, it was seriously professional already even though not, not legally professional, right? We can discuss this later, but this is the, the idea. Then you have one more thing about the rivalry between Peñarol and Nacional is the fact that the 1903 league was played and by the end of it, Peñarol and Nacional were tied and there was a, a final required to decide the league. But then by January of 1904, that much could not be played in due time because civil war started in Uruguay. That was the very last one that lasted the, between 03 and 04. And uh, some of the national players, particularly the Cespedes guys, would not want to be drafted and go to war. So they were 
hired, you know, by some Buenos Aires teams to go and play the other side of the river, and they left. And the league was suspended, and so that final would not be played in time. So the war passed in 1903-04. It was like a one-year, some months war. And by September, the league that was still dominated by the British would force the match to be played, even though Nacional wouldn't have the full potential because some of its players would be on in Buenos Aires. And I got this story told by one of the Peñarol players, Thomas Davis, who was a very good player and had played all the years from 1892 up to this final. He narrates that the game was going to be played at the Albion field in El Prado. And they arrived there, the Peñarol team, and was almost about to start the match when they see from a field uh, nearby already changed with the national shirt coming the Cespedes brothers, who would, were allowed especially to, to travel from Buenos Aires to join, you know, Nacional and play that final by the president. Actually, this guy, Baje Ordóñez, that I mentioned, that was a football uh, pioneer as well. And, and actually, Nacional won that match 3-2. And this was, I think, the very, you know, explosion of the rivalry between the two, Peñarol and Nacional. And from then on, the big British team, Peñarol, knew that they had like an equal in Nacional. And that was the origin of In the 20 years that followed this, Nacional became more important and uh, actually dominated the first three decades. And even that, up to the 50s, it was like the most important team then, but not in terms of following. Peñarol always had like a huge following compared or bigger, I would say, than Nacional. And uh, in this, from the 60s to 2000, the scene was dominated more by Peñarol than Nacional. So th there were long cycles of dominance between these two teams. Now this 21st century has been more in favor of Nacional than Peñarol a little bit but they would dominate the scene like almost totally with some exceptions, some years, but it's more like Real Barca, you know? So you have them winning mostly all the leagues for a century, a long century. And then other teams would try to get into the league. And the most interesting story, I would say, is the River Plate story. Because as I said, they were proletarians and they would not be accepted by these middle high class guys and culture guys, you know, with university studies or high school studies. So at some point, River Plate formally asked to be accepted. And the league decided that they would introduce like a new rule. That is, if you want to enter the league, you have to win the second division like three times in a row, <laughs> which, which is... <laughs> Absurd, totally. So River Plate won three times in a row, the, the second division, so they had to be allowed. And they entered the league and they won it actually like three or four times in their, during the, this period that it was 1907 or five, six up to 1919 or 1920. This was the River Plate glorious, let's say, um, period. And River Plate gave great players to those 10, 15 years to the Uruguayan uh, national team. Actually, the Celeste, the, the national shirt of Uruguay, comes from River Plate in some way because they had to play one match in 1910, on August 15, 1910. They had to play, they, they had to represent Uruguay against uh, an Argentine team for one of the cups they would play every year. And... Um, the Argentines, they, they had to change the, their shirt and they used, they decided to use one that was available, that was all sky blue and they won. So actually from that moment on, the Uruguayan shirt was the sky blue one. So it's a little bit linked to River Plate. And then, so these guys, when they were accepted, they were accepted because their skills, because they were good enough. But at the same time, most of them, not all of them, but most of them were, as I said, like people from um, poor neighborhoods, like uh, workers, you know, proletarians. So that was like a message introduced to the league. And actually one of the delegates of River Plate at the very first session, there were some 
interesting guys in political terms. Most of them were anarchists. So, and the, the first shirt of Rear Blade was black, all black. So <laughs> they, they would pass like this terrorist kind of message, you know, <laughs> back in the day. And these guys were politicians and journalists, the, the delegates of Rear Plate, leftist, you know, like kind of people. And they would, I think at the very first league session, they would make the claim that the proceedings should be in Spanish because this was Uruguay, you know, so why in English? And actually, finally, the things changed into Spanish. And at the same time, they kind of introduced some sort of transparency in the discussions of the league. Of course, they would be favored by transparency because if there were some business between the other teams, it was easier to, to hide them, you know, if everything was in English. So it was like a, a closed circle, more exclusive, let's say, circle. So these guys played different roles symbolically and also in terms of the actual, you know, administrative aspects of football in order to open it a little bit to the Uruguayan people. And... Um, Okay, so that was the old River Plate, and that's the old league that was dominated by, you know, at the beginning it was Peñarol, then two years Nacional, then another year Peñarol. Actually, in 1905, it's important this thing también, as well, because uh, Nacional won two, 1902 and 1903. 1904 was not played. 1905, if Nacional would win, they would get the, the cup in, in for themselves, in property, as they say, because there was a, a rule that if you win three times, you win it for your headquarters. So Peñarol uh, actually made one move that was the first time that happened and connect us with professionalization. So they bought basically three players from Nacional. They offered them jobs in the railway company, very well paid ones. And one of the guys who actually had to pay for their family, etc., accepted, and the other two guys well, went to the other side as well. So they were bought by Peñarol, and this is the very first transfer in Uruguayan football. And um, Nacional entered like a bad time from 1905 up to 1910. They never won the league in these five years. That was won by River Plate, by Wanderers, mostly. And I think one year was the Kirk. So I said this connected to democratization because by 1910, Nacional, who had been founded with a, a lot of sponsorship and had a lot of popular support, was considering uh, leaving the game because they would not be able to win any championship between 04, 03, let's say, and, and 1910. And this is an important moment for the Uruguayan football because an internal current within Nacional won the elections by the end of 1910 with a platform, let's say, of opening the club and democratizing the club, which means by the time opening the, the doors of the club to every social class. Players, the, the fact is that there were a couple of very, very good players the, the best one was called Angel Romano. He would play in Paris in 1924. So he was a kid, 17 or 18 years old back then. And uh, he was a genius, and, but he was very poor. He was a mason and would not be uh, able to play most of the games because the directors of the team, you know, the captain, etc., would not allow him to play. So the dressing room was complicated for Nacional back by the end of 1910. And uh, these, some people inside the club, especially a, a medical doctor called Jose Maria Delgado, would head like a current that tried to democratize the club and allow guys like Romano to play. And this happened, actually. They won the elections for a small margin because this is interesting as, as well that Nacional already by 1910 had some sort of internal structure with elections. Right, I mean, that was not very common in these clubs originally. Actually, when Nacional was founded 10 years earlier, there was no structure whatsoever. They were, they gathered in a house and they designed, one guy was the captain and the other one was the president. Basically, the captain would have the preeminence in football decisions and the, the president would be the delegate before the league 
or concerting matches with other guys. So that was the, all the structure the, the club had. But 10 years later, they already have a, like a headquarters, uh, like a house, and they had a secretary and blah, blah. Which makes me think as well that they already were able to manage some money, to use some money and administer some money, even though they were amateur, apparently. So the, these were the seeds of the discussion between professionals and amateurs. There was money in the, and players started to realize that this money was not ending in their pockets. It was ending somewhere else. So this is the origins of that discussion. And actually by 1911, 12, etc., it was common that there were at least companies would sponsor either teams or players, or let's say players through teams. For instance, Angel Romano, this guy, when all this thing situation was happening in Nacional, he was tempted by, bueno, first he crossed to Kurk and because he had friends there and played one year and a half at Kurk. But then he was brought to Buenos Aires and started to play for Boca Juniors. Those were the very first important years for Argentine teams outside Albion. The most important team in Argentina was Racing Club and then Boca Juniors and Independiente and San Lorenzo and other, other teams were already existing and starting to play at the first level. And um, Romano would be sponsored by Gat y Chavez, that is a, like a department store in Buenos Aires. So they would pay him as an employee, but he would never step there in the store. He went and just played football and was paid by the store. So that's professional, right? But it's not, so we used to call it amateurismo marrón. That's brown amateurism. It's like a shady, you know, <laughs> way of, of being professional, right? But not- Shamateurism, as they call it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think that the football has always been very, very opaque, very um, unclear in terms of money from the very onset. And at least here, probably yeah. not- so in Britain, where you organize the professional football more clearly from the start in 1885, but here it was in the interest of clubs. So they never pushed too much to define a, a sort of legal set of standards, rules, etc. So they could do their businesses without being molested by the state, especially uh, or, and, uh, by the justice and whatever. And it actually was a quite unfair situation for players. And they would protest here and there. But the structure of clubs knew from the beginning that by incentivizing the competition between players, they would benefit because the best players would get much more money than the other players. And if you are a very good player and are, getting, are making some money, you are not very prone to create a syndicate or whatever because they promoted some sort of egoism. At the same time, by 1915, 16, 17, 20, and obviously after 24, football players here in the area would become to be popular stars. And that came with benefits, privileges, money, etc. So that still added some more element that played a role in not clarifying anything, let's say, because the important guys in the game would benefit for that. So both players and officials of the clubs. I noticed that by 1917, when another now disappeared, but in, back then important club called Lito uh, was founded, I saw the proceedings of the founding of Lito. And in 1917, they already started by creating like 10 commissions in the club with the officials, you know, so one commission to attend, you know, like uh, uh, youth football and another one to connect with the neighborhood and uh, like uh, many of them. So by 1917, there was a Byzantine complex structure to clubs that was not in place 20 years earlier. So it was a very fast uh, development as well. Many people by then, it was very popular football already. You had tens of thousands of people in important matches and the football had become already like a connecting social factor, important one in a middle-class society as the Uruguayan was back then. 
So you had uh, clubs all over the city. Of course, football was a completely urban phenomenon. There was no football in the countryside at all. Yes, in secondary cities in the country, by this 1905, 6, 7, 8, etc., you would have teams, but it was mostly a Montevideo. And the cracks and players would, be, would come from Montevideo, would be from Montevideo. And um, so this growth uh, was quite fast. And in 20 years, you had like a very complex, a very full-fledged, let's say, scene uh, of football in Montevideo. And Buenos Aires, of course, and Rosario as well. In closing, as the game grew in this first decade of the century, international football would follow suit. And we mentioned before the emergence of Brazil, the main rivalry in South America would be between Uruguay and Argentina. And besides the geographical proximity, the game had developed faster in those nations. And a rivalry would ensue, football for terms, socially, etc. Politically, I'm sure. And uh, eventually, a Copa America would be established in 1916 for the nations of South America to compete. And naturally, Uruguay and Argentina, but especially Uruguay, would be winning most of these uh, tournaments. So this would eventually would lead us into our for our next episode where we discuss the glories of the Olympics and the World Cup. But mm -hmm. at this stage, Uruguay would have some of the players that would be playing in those tournaments. What was the reason for its success, development, the rivalry, and uh, any other important aspect associated with the national team? Well, you know that football is... It's a very complex thing. So to explain why uh, one team won is, is impossible, really, <laughs> mostly. Sometimes that happens. But basically, there are some stable factors that I would mention. Well, one of them, the most important one, actually, to be fair to the Argentines, is that it was a system. So they were one thing. The Uruguayan and Argentine teams would play continuously against each other. They would cross the river. You... You had already in place back then a sh ship service, a boat service that would cross overnight. So you go to sleep in Montevideo and awake in Buenos Aires and vice versa. So the, the, the traveling is nothing in terms of time, in, in terms of the, your working day. So whole teams would travel, would cross the river back and forth continuously. There were tournaments established very early. The Thai Cup, called Thai Cup, or Chevalier Boutel. Uh, Chevalier Boutel was an Englishman who would uh, be an important figure in football in Buenos Aires, but he also was one of the founders of the Montevideo Rowing Club. So he was a sportsman, as they would say in the, back in the day, that, that would cross, uh, would, would act in both sides of the river. And he established this cup that would be played between teams, not national teams, but clubs who won the called Competencia Cup. That was like a, not the League Cup, but a different one. It's in, in the model of the FA Cup, I would say. And they would play once a year this Chevalier Boutel from, I think, 1901. I don't know what, I don't remember the exact year, but it's 1901 for sure. There was one, probably that was the first year. Then you had the Thomas Lipton, the famous T mogul, and uh, he, he was uh, Scott. He established another cup that became very important because it was played between national teams, the Lipton Cup. And the Lipton Cup was played between 1905 and, well, intensely until 1930 and then rarely played after that. But until I think in 1992, there was one that was played, but it was not the same. But by those formative years of 05 to 20 or to 30, it was the National Cup of Rio de la Plata. It was won more by Argentina than Uruguay, like 18 to 11 or something like that. I would need to go and check who won it more in those particular years because later cups are not the same. So it would be misleading to count them just roughly. You know, you have to go and, and check the, the years. It's not important. Actually, my point is that they would play continuously against each other. And then you have a third factor, that is, so you have the, the system of football, learning from each other. You have the continuous games 
both friendly, well, friendly games, there were hundreds and hundreds in those years, no? the National Wood Cross, Boca Juniors, etc. There were friendships uh, created between clubs. Actually, Nacional and Boca were very close friends, and Peñarol and River Plate were very close friends as well. And they be present in the inauguration of the field of the other one and in exchange players, loan money to each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there, there was a, the system worked in that level as well. And the third factor, I said, is that maybe, maybe, only maybe this could have played a role in favor of Uruguay, is that because Uruguayan football democratized earlier, relatively, because Peñarol also had their democratization crisis in 1913-14. I could touch on very fast on that because I know we are finishing that because Uruguayan football democratized itself a little bit earlier, it allowed to enter all the talent from, you know, different to recruit the, the very best from wherever they were. And uh, actually, already in 1916, when Uruguay won the first Copa America, there were two black players playing in the national team in Uruguay. Race and social class are not that strictly linked, I would say, in the Uruguayan culture of the beginning of the century, because society in Uruguay never was that class tight, divided. So it was more normal. It was more normal to see that happening. But anyway, it happened. And actually, it was unusual for South American standards. Actually, a Chilean journalist from El Mercurio, that is the most important newspaper in Santiago, in Chile, created like a formal protest, a protestation from the Chilean Federation because Uruguay had included two Africans. So they believed that the black guys were from Africa, not Uruguayan citizens. So that unusual was the thing, right? Because it was a national team, so you had to be born in, in that country, no? in Uruguay, Argentina, whatever. So the first Copa America had the f very first four teams that played football regularly. There were Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, and Chile. Those were the first. Then Paraguay was included a little bit la later, a few years. And then those five, then I think Peru is the fifth one. Uh, the sixth one, etc. So several countries, especially in the north of the South American continent, like Colombia, Venezuela, etc., would not play football. Ecuador would, would not play until later on in the, in the century. So, and Brazil had their own crisis, you know, process of democratization that was much, much longer than what happened in Rio de la Plata, where I say decades longer, Actually, for 1930, for the World Cup, there still were issues with a race yes. that played a role in the selection of players. And even as late as 1950, there were some internal, you know, like a rivalry between Sao Paulo and Rio that allegedly played a role in not, them not being able to, to create the, the best of selections because of this rivalry, etc., and who was the coach, etc. So... I would say that that issue was fully solved in Brazil only for the Pelé generation in 58. Before that, there were still issues and it was still a sort of a barrier for, for achieving the best of their very skilled players from the very beginning. But the one thing was the individual players and another thing was creating or being able to gather, you know, like a good national team. So I said Peñarol, actually Kirk, this Central Uruguay Railway Cricket Club, British uh, formed club in 91, played under that name, but the headquarters of the railway company were established in a rural area northwest of Montevideo that is called Peñarol. It's a, it's a neighborhood, a, a, locali um, a little town originally. They, now it's integrated with the city, but back then was not. They were the workshops and the, where the company was established and um, from the very beginning, I would say from 1900 on, this uh, club had a large following. It's difficult to explain why, probably because it was the very first important team along with the Albion. And it was metaphorizing, I would say, modernity and had a very strong proletarian base because of the families, you know, of the people who would gather around the company that was a huge company, a multinational important company. So you had hundreds of families, etc. Anyway, so this team was a popular one from the beginning. 
But at the same time, with the rivalry with Nacional, it was always the following of Peñarol, even to this day, it was a little unruly, let's say. <laughs> they were, so they would start creating economic problems to the company from the very beginning, because imagine you have a derby to be paid in the Peñarol field, in Peñarol, this little town. So you had thousands of aficionados going from Montevideo in, tra in the train, uh, taking the train. Actually, the company would put open trains for people to go. And um, if Peñarol lost, maybe they would uh, destroy a couple of carriages, right? They would set fire to some of them, etc. So it was a mess for the company. And then their, some of their engineers or, or some of their workers would be players at the same time, and they would ask for the day or two days or three days after the match because they were tired or because they were that, as so important that they could ask for a day and nobody could say no. So finally, the company was fed up, you know, with all these. And by 1911, 12, they started like pushing the club out of the company, trying to, for the club to get independent from the company. They wanted nothing more to do with it. And this is what happened in 1913, 14. There was a movement that actually separated the team from the company and created formally a new team that is Club Atletico Peñarol. So this is why the club is, is called Peñarol now. The shirt is the same. The following is the same. And I think sociologically, there's a continuity. But in terms of administration, it's a different team. So it's a long po polemics here in Uruguay because of some people from Nacional say that Nacional is the decano. So it's the, the older team because Peñarol was actually formally created in only in 1913, etc. And that this is very boring and I pay no attention to it, but it exists. So Peñarol actually became a different team in sociological terms a little bit, especially the officials would be recruited from the Italian, um, you know, immigrants from 1913 on. They were not anymore like the British gent gentlemen, but, the, but these other guys. So, and so by 1914, I would say the football in Uruguay was totally criollo. There were no more British involved in any important way. We've had a very good base for the roots of the game uh, in Uruguay. And uh, yeah, a lot of things that I never knew. And I thank you for you know, going through and explaining everything. And uh, for our next podcast, we'll delve into the Olympics adventure and the glory era of the Uruguayan football. And that's something I am looking forward to. Once again, it's, um, it's amazing how a game affects, like we said, the sociology, the politics, and mm -hmm. the culture of a nation. They're interlinked. Once again, I thank you for going through and explaining all this to us. Thank you, Sham. Thank you. Yeah, and for me, it's a, it's a really rich history, and thank you for bringing it to life for us. Uh, thank you, Paul. Once again, I would like to thank Professor Matsukelli for his participation in this series. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. You may contact me on my blog or on Twitter. I'm at SP1873 on Facebook under Soccer Nostalgia. Mr. Paul Whittle is on Twitter at 1888letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify under Soccer Nostalgia Talk Podcast. Mr. Matsukelli can be contacted on email mzz017 at gmail.com. And the link to your book is also attached to this uh, blog and uh, Spotify podcast. So if anyone wants to check out your book that we mentioned earlier, Del Ferrocarril al Tango, El Estilo del Fútbol Uruguay, Uruguayo, 1891-1930. That's in Spanish. I doubt if it's been translated in English, right? It, it's being translated right now. Oh, it's being? Oh, so, very good. Very good. So I wish, I wish it's, I mean, hopefully it's going to be in English uh, at some point in the future. Oh, very good. Well, we'll look out for that. Yeah. So once again, thank you and looking forward to our next podcast with you. Thank you. Thank you very much.